Uh, we have some excellent panelists here today. Uh, we have um, Dr. R.G. Restar, uh, mm -hmm. Pat Kelly, Victoria, um, and Jeanette Mari, and Dr. Joanna Brown, who is currently trying to solve some technical difficulties, but hopefully she'll be with us uh, in just a few moments. And so I just, uh, I figure we'll start by going around and doing a round of introductions about who we are um, and our interest in LGBT health. And then we can get started with some discussion questions. And uh, at the very end, uh, we'll try and make some time for a brief Q and A um, for those of you in the audience who would like to ask some questions. And so, to start, my name is Ray. I am a second year MPH student concentrating in health behavior. I am also the chair of master's advocacy on the graduate student council. And this event is co-sponsored by the GSC, uh, the School of Public Health and the School of Professional Studies. And I'll hand it off to Jen. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Jen Nazarino. You can call me Jen. Um, I am an interim associate dean of academic affairs and innovation for the School of Professional Studies. I'm a faculty member over at the School of Public Health, and I am the academic director of our online MPH program. I will turn it to Victoria. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Victoria. I'm a third year medical student at Brown, um, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'll turn it over to Pat. Hi everyone, I'm Pat Kelly. I'm a first year PhD student in the Behavioral and Social Health Sciences uh, program in the School of Public Health. Um, should I also discuss maybe research interests broadly? Sure. Okay. Um, and so what I focus on uh, for my work is how people meet their health care needs when they cannot access formalized health care. And so I look at the psychosocial and structural factors that may um, result in people being excluded from the formalized medical system. And then ultimately, once people are in a circumstance where they have a health care need that they have to address, what are they doing? How are they forming community to ultimately address that need? And I look at this primarily uh, in the areas of substance use and LGBTQ health. And I will pass it over to Dr. Reeser. Hi, everyone. Good evening. And uh, we have a short time today, so I just wanted to say thank you for uh, making time and energy to be present here today. Uh, we have a lot to chat about. It's a lot of things that, as, men, as um, Ray mentioned, a lot of things that are happening um, throughout different levels and different angles around LGBT health and policy. So happy to dig more into it and perhaps, you know, answer some of your questions. Um, I'm an alum of Brown um, at the Department of Behavioral Sciences, where I did my PhD um, back in 2020. And so that was pandemic times. We were you know, sort of the first cohort where we ended up with a virtual ceremony. Um, so that was quite an experience. Um, I am now at University of Washington here in Seattle and the Department of Epidemiology and Health Sciences and Population Health. Um, and kind of really just thinking about situating myself in spaces where I can do my work um, quite um, autonomously and being able to do the work you know, uh, and focusing on some of the solutions that I am now able to do as part of faculty or as being in this new position and wearing many different hats. And so in addition to being a faculty here, I'm also an affiliate at Yale where I think about policy systems and how we can improve and respond to some of the things that we are currently seeing. Um, I am also a co-founder for a community engagement stakeholder group here in Washington um, and creating that space for uh, redefining what it means to have expertise in trans health. And so I've formulated a community engagement slash uh, uh, stakeholder group where essentially it's made up of different community members, uh, the stakeholders, trans um, scientists, scholars, outside of UW and inside of UW, because obviously our work is not just siloed within the university. And um, I question on a, on a monthly basis in terms of what it means to do, you know, trans health and, and push forward that knowledge and trans health within institutional spaces and still making that accessible to community members. And so I try my best to visualize what that looks like. Um, 
I think about uh, where trans health can go in the next decade, decades um, in the US and what that would look like, you know, um, and also globally too. Um, and so happy to chat more in terms of what it means and what it takes to envision some of that and what it means to build um, a community of scholars, specifically trans scholars who are going to continue that vision and that work. Um, I am in my, I'm a millennial. <laughs> and so kind of thinking about, you know, um, uh, what it means to do this work longitudinally and what it means to um, sustain that work beyond um, my lifetime. And so just wanted to uh, open the conversation and feel free to ask me any questions that are based on any of that. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Restar. Um, Dr. Brown, um, were you able to solve those technical difficulties? If so, uh, if you could please give us just a quick introduction about yourself before we get into the discussion questions we have. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, I'm so sorry I was late. Um, I had audio problems. Um, so uh, thanks, uh, Raymond. I'm so uh, really honored to be a part of this that, uh, and uh, kind of excited, was excited to get the invitation. And um, I am a family physician and adolescent medicine doctor. Um, here, uh, well, actually working currently at Boston Children's um, in the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine. And um, my background is both um, in uh, primary care and kind of policy and public health. Um, I was the medical director at a community health center uh, prior to this position um, called, uh, the health center is called Well One Primary Medical and Dental Care, and it's in Rhode Island. And um, also uh, had a stint as medical director at the Rhode Island Training School in the past. Um, I've done work related to uh, advocacy around adolescent confidentiality. Um, and uh, I, uh, I myself um, am married to a state rep, uh, Rebecca Kislak, who I know teaches at the public health program. Um, and uh, so, you know, end up being involved in uh, policy either vicariously or in person occasionally. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, my focus tends to be on primary care. So, you know, I love really thinking about how to create medical homes for LGBTQIA plus folks in a primary care setting. Um, and um, uh, I would say, yeah. And I think that's enough, <laughs> so thanks. Great. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so, well, this panel focuses on LGBT health and we wanted to integrate both the perspective of public health and medicine. So I guess uh, with that, it, I think probably the best question to start with is uh, what roles do medicine and public health play in the health of the LGBTQ population? Are there areas of overlap and how can these two fields work together more effectively to care for the needs of the LGBTQ community? And this is open to uh, any of our panelists. Um, yeah, Dr. Brown, do you want to take that first or do you want me to take that first? Totally up to you. Uh, sure, I can speak briefly. I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's a general question. Um, you know, I think that um, medicine, you know, really needs to be providing um, welcoming, um, you know, LGBTQIA affirming care. Um, and I think, you know, some of us do a better job at that than others, and we can all always do better. Um, so if, we, if we're thinking at the clinical level, and then um, I myself don't hold, hold a public health post, um, but I think, you know, public health, we can think about public health in terms of community health, we can think of it in terms of uh, documenting and compiling data so that we know what's going on in the health of, um, of uh, queer folks, LGBTQIA folks. So um, that's my brief perspective. And, and then we, we overlap, right? Because a, a clinical place can do outreach. A clinical place can have community programs um, and can offer, can offer things that are a benefit to the public. 
Yeah, I certainly agree with that. And I want to expand the conversation a little bit in terms of, you know, there's the medical community, there's the public health community, um, but there's also, you know, the, pub, the, the policy, legal communities, and mm. also the community in general, broadly, that we also need to be engaged with. So it's not just these two fields, but I think it's important to make sure that the way that we are viewing and approaching the work involves everyone. And it really has to be intersectional in the way that we think about solutions, um, intersectional in a way that, you know, if we are going to put health equity and it has been put in the map for sure, but if we are going to continue doing that and being sustainable, um, and moving away from sort of health disparities research to more solution based, which is what health equity is, and it's really cru crucial to think about how do we target and um, uh, address, uh, you know, a lot of these intersectional oppressive systems um, in order for us to be able to address some of the health um, inequities that we see in LGBTQ populations more and other populations as well more effectively. So I'd say it's crucial for us to be able to do that. I think some countries are probably um, better at doing it, looking at a policy level, for example. Um, so for example, there are countries that are really good at uh, public health. Um, they're really good at prevention. They're really good at um, targeting before things before, you know, be, before um, at the, before it reaches the treatment level. I think the U.S. from a policy perspective is really interesting um, and focuses so much on treatment rather than prevention. You know, that's where most of our healthcare system is being built. And so when you look at it, it's like, you know, the, the, the U.S. system is mostly medical, um, you know, and we need more public health individuals. We need public health individuals to be able to join the conversations and address some of the um, limitations of medical communities, um, but also along the way invite different people with different perspectives to be able to do that. Um, and I can cite, and I can certainly cite some countries for sure that are doing a lot better when it comes to prevention. <laughs> Um, but one can certainly look at our neighbors um, e quite easily to be able to um, address that. Pat, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say, if I could briefly add to that, I also think that um, in my experience, the most fruitful collaborations in the space of LGBTQI plus health have really been when there have been, you know, folks from the public health sphere and from clinical medicine collaborating because we, I found that um, oftentimes we kind of bring different views to the work that we're doing as we should, right? We're typically seeing different things in our day to day and that the projects that I have worked on where we've had um, folks who come from both of those disciplines and both of those backgrounds and importantly, people who are trained in both as well have just been able to kind of more comprehensively um, understand uh, the issue that we might be focused on. And also, I think, um, Dr. Reister, you mentioned policy, kind of bring in an approach to thinking through policy solutions more holistically in a way that is actually more true to the lived experience, right? Because it doesn't make sense to really silo these, these concepts um, at all. Yeah, and I just want to add to that the, the last point about the connection between research, public health, medicine, and policy, there's just not a ton at the moment of communication, and we need to build within the public health structure and in, within the medical system uh, ways to be able to leverage some of those communication strategies to really understand, you know, what would policymakers need in order for them to make policy decisions and push forward a policy. And I think we need, if, if I were to critique our field, it would just be to do a little bit better uh, with communication strategies um, within our medical programs, within our public health programs in terms of, um, you know, like in terms of how do we package um, a, a solution where, you know, where obviously many of us have worked in research and being able to come up with evidence, right? And being able to support that evidence with so many different research avenues. How do we communicate and package that so that it's um, uh, understandable 
um, with policymakers and the organizations that they're attached to and their constituents. Right? So I think it's important that we gain those skills and shared language to be able to um, really describe, define what the problem is because you can't address a problem if you can't define it um, and, um, and come up with the different solutions. Um, and including, you know, including cost-effective uh, analysis, including um, uh, uh, social-related kind of um, uh, trade-offs that we can do uh, to make waves in terms of being able to be effective in pushing forward our recommendations and our policies. And I think in academia, I will say that it's kind of... Um, not, uh, it's kind of frowned upon to say um, advocacy, the word advocacy, but I think that it's important to embrace some of that and that we can still do our work and recognize that we have our own set of biases and we are able to be transparent with that bias, our biases and being able to address that um, and, and be transparent with uh, uh, how we dealt with those biases. Um, in order for us to move forward with our evidence, because we do, we are in many ways are, are experts in our fields, right? Um, and But I think advocating for strategies is okay. And I think it's okay for us to embrace that word. Thanks, Sarji. I wanted to also um, bring in some um, individualized questions for our panelists. And I wanted to ask Victoria, um, People who identify as bisexual often report feeling marginalized and excluded from both straight communities as well as queer social circles. Victoria, can you talk about the added barriers that this creates for bisexual people in accessing healthcare? Yeah, I would love to. So as a little bit of background, um, this was a big part of my summer research. Um, I just want to flag, though, that um, this was summer research. I'm not doing pursuing a PhD in this area. I'm very much still just a little medical student trying to make my way. Um, but what I did end up finding, so we spent a lot of time sifting through data and trying to find trends. And really consistently, um, we were seeing that pretty much across the board when we asked questionnaire questions um, regarding different ways in which folks would have a diff difficulties accessing healthcare. If there was something that was difficult for individuals identifying as um, a binary gay or lesbian individual, it was almost unanimously twice as difficult for somebody identifying as um, either bisexual or it was even harder if folks were had an un, un, unidentified um, sexual orientation or if they were questioning. Um, so I can't I can't speak to precisely why this was. Um, one of the more striking statistics that we found was um, that individuals who were bisexual were four times more likely to not be able to access mental health care um, as compared to individuals who were straight. Um, so I, I can't say. Um, in particular, why this was, because we also found this for things like being unable to make appointments over the phone or being unable to um, come in in person, things that you wouldn't normally associate as being associated with somebody's sexuality. Um, but I do think that there is a lot of evidence that being excluded from multiple um, groups and just facing social exclusion on all sides can be a really destabilizing thing for, for individuals. And of course, that bleeds into all parts of somebody's, um, somebody's experience. But um, yeah, I was also, um, would it be okay if I just quickly reference the last question? Because I, I had, um, would that be okay? Do we have? Okay. I, one thing that really st stuck with me in terms of bringing together these two, um, these worlds was the, the lack of trust really that there is within the community. I've been doing some work with, I don't know if folks are familiar with Project Weber Renew, um, but they're a really great um, community organization that does work with people who are LGBTQ, um, many of whom are unhoused and many of whom um, are involved with sex work. And there's really, there really seems to be an intense um, feeling of distrust with research, especially 
um, because there, there is this feeling that research is something that is done to people um, and is not necessarily something that is done with people. So I think a really big, I'll, I'll keep it short because I know this was the last question, but I think a really big place to start is making sure that everything we're doing is being done with folks um, and not being done to folks um, and making sure that as institutions with power, we're being really careful and making sure that we're not, um, we're not accidentally causing harm where, where we shouldn't be. Yes, I totally agree. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I'm, I'm gonna kind of move us along. Um, next question is directed at you, Pat. So substance use, as we um, all are aware, is heavily stigmatized. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how this stigma associated with substance use intersects with stigma from identifying as a member of the LGBTQ community? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a fantastic question. It's also one that um, I just want to kind of get ahead of in the sense that I think um, a, a this, this requires a, an answer that goes beyond um, just this conversation here. But I want to start out by um, conceptualizing stigma as a fundamental cause of disease. And by that, what I mean is stigma is a, 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 it's a natural phenomenon that occurs between people within the context of an unequal distribution of power that most often results in the targeting of different attributes of one's identity or social positions that they may hold. And within stigma is subsumed um, discrimination. And um, it's, I think, correct to think of stigma as a fundamental cause of disease because across time, what we see is as we create um, interventions to mitigate the harms of stigma, unfortunately, we see that the effects, the link between stigma and poor health persists with time, despite these um, interventions that we may have to address the way that stigma can manifest. And so with that understanding, I also think it's important to bring in intersectionality as a framework or an analytic tool or practice that we can um, leverage to understand how people who hold multiple identities that may be the object of social oppression. Um, historically, in the context of substance use, we can look to the war on drugs as um, sort of a, a structural example from the state, state waged uh, oppression, specifically on black, black and brown communities. Um, and then we can also conceptualize uh, how stigma has affected LGBTQI plus people um, historically, and unfortunately, we see this to continue to persist today, not just interpersonally, but at the political level, where we have really draconian and grotesque attacks on trans youth um, specifically. And so intersectionality allows us a framework with which we can understand how people who may hold identities, such as being uh, LGBTQI+, and also maybe someone who may use substances, how both of these identities are um, unfortunately stigmatized through multiple levels of, of existence at an individual level, and a personal level, community level, and structural level. And that um, uh, when this happens, it's, it's more than just kind of understanding the experience of being stigmatized as a person who's queer and, and a person who has a substance use disorder. It's the compounding effect of the two of those together that results often in an amplification of um, things that could be health harming. So substance use to cope with the, the, the stress that comes from being discriminated against because of, you're a person of trans experience. Um, and I think that unfortunately we, like I mentioned, can see this really play out um, today and every day as we continue to see new attacks specifically targeted to um, trans youth and trans adults as well in terms of um, efforts to restrict access to gender affirming care and to cope with that sort of persistent stigma and discrimination, people turn to substances um, and it results in this compounding um, negative effects on health that takes a lot of different efforts at the policy level, I think, to, to really address. Pat, thank you for bringing in stigma and intersectionality into the conversation. I also wanted to make sure Dr. Brown joins us um, in talking about um, her uh, 
uh, her focus on uh, as a clinician in adolescent health. Um, with mental health being a significant area of concern um, among this population, how does this affect queer youth? What are some unique and intersectional challenges in caring for their mental health? Uh, thank you so much for that question, uh, Jennifer um, and the group. Um, and I also just wanted to, you know, uh, say that I really appreciate the discussion about intersectionality and about kind of dual, dual roles and dual issues that people might be coping with at the same time. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I think people are aware we're facing like a mental health crisis in general uh, right now, um, I think in this country and particularly among youth. I mean, I can say um, just in my own work. And again, when you're thinking about being a clinician, it's like, you know, one story at a time and you can't really repeat them because they're private. Um, but, um, but I'm, you know, we're just a separate example. We're seeing tons of um, youth with eating disorders, like far more, far, far more in the hospital than we've ever had before um, related to COVID. Um, so you, you do have the added issue of COVID affecting people's mental health um, which I think is almost like an amplifier. And then um, the, you know, as we know, these horrible, vicious attacks um, from the right on uh, trans youth and trans people um, are, um, you know, affect folks' mental health as well. And so, um, so youth are feeling it. And a survey came out with 21, 2021 data from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, you may be familiar with that, um, but unfortunately, um, you know there are a lot. They they didn't unfortunately look at trans youth. Um, it's LGBTQ youth, and you know on pretty much every index that I'm looking at, um, LGBTQ youth are suffering more, um, and, and so feeling feelings of sadness or hopelessness. Um, during the past year, LGBTQ, 69%, heterosexual, 35%. And it just goes on and on like that, you know, felt too unsafe to go to school. Um, it's like, you know, twice as many among LGBTQ folks. So anyway, that's just one, one snapshot of public health level data that we do have access to. Um, and I mean, in terms of my own experience with youth, you know, I feel like it's it's pretty erratic. Like I might have a young person um, who's gay, who is able to access mental health care, you know, who has a therapist, who is able to get the psych meds that they need, um, you know, who feels supported. And then I might have another young person who, um, you know, who is struggling, who, um, you know, is gender fluid or who whose sexual sexual orientation is fluid, um, for whom we're having a really hard time finding a therapist. There just aren't enough therapists to go around. I mean, I have parents who got these kids on three different wait lists for therapists and none of those wait lists move. And, you know, then the kids come in and they've had a setback and they, you know, cut their wrist and ended up in the ER. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's pretty tough. Um, and so, you know, as a clinician, I'm just always trying to scrounge and figure out, you know, can I find a therapist through, you know, this group that I work with? Can I get on the wait list? How do I beg for this patient to convince them to take them? Um, you know, if I go through a different route, like in another clinic setting, I can, I can get them into, let's say, the mental health walk-in hours, but then it's a year to actually get assigned someone. So, um, you know, I think people are seeing this all over the place. We, we also see it as clinicians when patients can't get into a specialized psychiatrist. And, you know, so you have a certain level of training um, in terms of doing sort of basic medication management, but then um, you often want the help of a psychiatrist when things get more complicated. And, and that's, you know, those spots are hard to find these days also. So um, I know what I'm describing isn't necessarily super specific to LGBTQIA youth, but, you know, I definitely, again, it's like anecdotal and one-on-one, -on -one, and I definitely 
I definitely have those patients who, you know, um, are struggling and I have patients who are doing okay. And I have patients, you know, who might be um, trans in, um, uh, you know, at state custody. And I have patients who might be trans who come in with their parents and, and people, you know, everyone's, their own unique person and everyone has their own unique set of challenges. Um, and we try to find resources to support them. And I'd say by and large, unfortunately, it's a challenge right now. Thank you, Dr. Brown. So continuing along with the line of um, just talking about transgender health uh, and also earlier, uh, we mentioned a few times about research with LGBT community. Uh, Dr. Restar, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, several years ago, a former faculty member at Brown published a controversial article that described a phenomenon they termed as rapid onset gender dysphoria. Um, Dr. Restar, if I recall correctly, you actually published a mythological critique of this article. Would you mind talking a little bit more about that and um, but how can future studies in both medicine and public health be more inclusive and respect the sensitivities of the LGBTQ community? Yeah, thank you, um, Ray. I appreciate this question a lot. And it's a question that's been both um, haunting me and also just kind of, um, uh, it follows wherever I go. And it's a, it's an important one that I need to also kind of um, understand in terms of what it means to address this from a different angles. Um, but I want to echo Dr. Brown's um, uh, 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 comment um, and insights around uh, prevention care, uh, specifically for trans youths. Um, you know, in my work, I, as I mentioned before, I do a lot of envisioning and like in terms of like what it means to really advance trans health um, and be able to have everyone receive high quality gender affirming care. And as uh, so of lately, you know, we've, I've been in conversations with many trans scholars in this field um, who are really kind of envisioning um, this, uh, this notion of uh, who's, who, who, you know, uh, what is accessibility looks like for gender affirming care, especially in the policy level, especially in, in the insurance level as well. Um, and we've kind of, um, kind of, Harkened a little bit on this notion that gender affirming care should be preventative services, should be part of preventative services, given the fact that we know that there are studies that shows, a bunch of studies that shows that gender affirming care improves quality of life, improves mental health, improves depression, anxiety, uh, and we need to start thinking about um, doing this uh, services as part of prevention care. Um, I say that because currently, you know, gender affirming care specific to hormones and surgeries and um, are only limited among those who are uh, diagnosed with gender dysphoria. And so that is a limitation of itself. So you can think about who can afford that diagnosis, what it would take for someone to get that diagnosis, um, and that not all trans people uh, require uh, hormones and surgeries to be able to live as a trans person in this country. And so um, it's really important to think about uh, gender affirming care more expansively beyond hormones, beyond surgeries, and really start to think about how can we integrate gender affirming care services as part of the other, uh, as, as a prevention service in and of itself, but also as part of, um, uh, as integrated in other sort of, uh, primary care, uh, other services like primary care, like mental health services. And so, thinking about how do we communicate that in the insurers um uh uh you know uh space or in the policy space is something to be thinking about um i encourage you all to start you know kind of engaging in conversations in terms of how can we push forward and an, an idea about you know uh reform not reforming <laughs> but like in some ways um opening that 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 uh opening that door so that not all trans people who want or desire to have that diagnosis of gender dysphoria can still receive care um, that they need. So for example, um, countries like Thailand who um, have been amazing and I just feel like advanced in terms and a safe haven for a lot of trans people, both in, in 
in, in Thailand and in neighboring countries in terms of like what it means to have to be able to access hormones and uh, other gender affirming services right at the pharmacy level, you know? So I think having those innovative strategies and, think, and thinking about, well, how can we kind of, is that possible in the US? Is it possible to think about gender affirming services in the same way that we think about reproductive health like um, uh, that uh, can be available over the counter? So I think it's, it's, it's these ideas and solutions that we have to really delve deeper. And we got to do that in, you know, in, in tandem with uh, communities, with community stakeholders. Um, and I think just to pivot a little bit into what Ray um, is asking, um, I think, you know, that is an example, that is a pitfall of um, that work is an example of what it means to do research in trans health that is not in community, right? So uh, what Lippmann uh, did, for example, um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the ROGD kind of uh, 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 topic, <laughs> um, is that, you know, they essentially hypothesized uh, and it's based on two premises. One is social contagion, that being trans is 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 that, um, and two, um, uh, that there are more um, assigned female sex at birth, AFAB individuals who are exhibiting that compared to um, uh, assigned male sex at birth um, individuals. And so her research is did not prove any of that. Um, I just want to say that, like, quite frankly, um, that, you know, and also it's a disgrace to the many researchers who are doing actual social contagion work. So social contagion um, is in its, a field and in its own, it's a science in of its own, it's respectable. And um, there are plenty of respectable researchers who have dedicated their time advancing that field. And so really, you know, Littman's work is really not up to that science. And it's the only way you know, for example, to be able to prove that 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 hypothesis is true, is that when you look at social contagion, you know, you are kind of thinking about, you know, um, essentially in time one, this happens, right? This quote unquote like disease happened, and time two, uh, they were exposed to or they uh, were engaged with, you know, one or two different people, and that when one of them becomes uh, exposed to that uh, disease, and then, and then you you have to um, essentially uh, display that there is multiplicity in, within each different timelines, right? And so, what is Lippmann's study? Lippmann's study is cross sectional. It did not display temporality, for example. So that violates the temporality kind of assumption of like what it means to do social contagion research, right? Um, and it reminds us of COVID transmission, right? It reminds us of work of like contact tracing. None of that happened in Littman. Um, and so to, to frame uh, to frame that as a social contagion in and of itself as a, um, a, a terrible <laughs> hypothesis um, to go forth and a lens as well. Um, and there are, uh, you know, there are findings that, um, you know, uh, more uh, APAB individuals are displaying this phenomenon versus AMAB individuals is that, you know, that was a premise to essentially their bias in con convenience sampling, right? They recruited um, parents, first and foremost, right? They recruited parents who are most likely concerned uh, with their children's gender identity. Right. And so uh, it just happens to be that many of those children are assigned female at birth. And a lot of the um, uh, respondents that or a lot of parents that uh, provided their responses were mothers. Right. And so you kind of so these are a reflection of concerned parents, concerned mothers. Um, and really what Littman captured is essentially the the uh, uh, the struggles of parents who are hovering suspicions over their trans uh, genders children identity right um, and so there's many plenty as a response to that and as 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 a separate side field in general there's, there are many interventions right now that are dedicated to uh, parent focused interventions um 
And on another note, when it comes to that, is they also find, you know, um, that they misinterpreted the results around uh, what it means to uh, reach out to different people. So, like for example, if you are um, uh, if you are discovering yourself and if you are embracing yourself as trans, for example, you want to, you know, you are um, uh, most likely inclined to learn about that in your um, in your social friends, et cetera, learn more about that. And so th they misinterpreted that as part of uh, social support, social cohesion, uh, which is quite well documented within trans communities uh, to be able to rely on each other to learn about knowledge, to, to learn about um, what it means to live the world as trans and to pass down those uh, generational kind of rights of passages and rights of knowledge in, um, when it comes to what it means to navigate the world as trans, right? So I think that was the reflection, that was the findings, really, if I were to interpret that. Um, and I think there are some aspects of Littman's work that kind of highlighted what it means to do work in trans health, right? It went to show, for example, um, that IRB and peer review systems are not perfect, right? That, um, that there are individuals who are within those spaces that are probably not competent to review trans health studies. And uh, just FYI, this was done uh, this, they got an approval at Mount Sinai and not at Brown, and so it's really important to kind of distinguish that. Um, but obviously, there are some work that, um, that they still, they're not at Brown anymore, but they were doing at Brown that also got through IRB at Brown as well. And so really holding institutions and committees and groups accountable to making sure that there are trans experts in those rooms. Um, is important, including peer review. So I encourage everyone here, when you all reach that point in your career where you are able to dedicate some volunteer time to um, engage yourself in those groups and committees to really um, to really be there and to really be present. Because um, I think about the work of indigenous populations, for example, that there are um, you know, when you're doing work research in indigenous populations, that there are these governing bodies that are already in place to review. You know, you can't just simply do indigenous population research without um, going through um, indigenous, like their own IRB system, right? Um, and so kind of there are some trans scholars these days that are thinking about like, okay, well, what if we apply that in trans health? And what does that look like? Or can we have some sort of hybrid approach where um, a study can't be uh, approve or can be published without a trans expert in the room. So just some solutions uh, to be provided there. Um, but yeah, and it's important to engage yourself and engage your research if you are doing any LGBT and any marginalized research with community members and stakeholders to avoid some of those pitfalls and to make sure that you actually interpret your results correctly. Um, uh, but thankfully, obviously, you know, they're not there at Brown anymore. They're somewhere else doing their own private research. Um, and, uh, but the work is not done. You know, some of the findings are in, are in policy spaces now. And once, once that is in the policy space, it's being cited in judicial chambers. It's being cited in Florida, for example. Um, and it's really important to, um, someone mentioned health communication, Jordan, um, you ran in the spot, like being able to understand now um, after the uh, sort of the aftermath of um, what it means to mitigate some of these like misinformation uh, and putting yourself in that place of actually this is not what Littman's work was providing um, and these are false information and these are uh, the alt not, these are the other facts it's that Anyways, that was a lot, but, <laughs> but um, thank you. to make sure that that, you know, that was clear. No, thanks, RJ. Yeah, um, Dr. Dr. Star, I, um, I think it was so important for you to write that methodological critique. I think that spoke volumes for a lot of folks that um, really um, were damaged by Littman's article and um, felt um, just really unsafe once that article came out. So thank you for highlighting and underscoring the importance of research. Um, and along the lines of talking about solutions, 
Um, in the last 10 minutes, uh, there um, the awesome folks in the audience, um, as well as I believe Pat had brought up, just the major shortage of clinicians um, um, in Rhode Island. Um, and so that particularly um, care for the LGBT, uh, LGBTQ plus community. Um, a question is what other resources exist? I know that uh, Project Weber Renew has been mentioned, but any other resources both locally and nationally, or even maybe RJ internationally, that for, um, for individuals not to feel so alone, given that the, there's these long waiting lists, maybe even six months or longer out. Um, I'm just gonna turn to you, Victoria, if you um, had any initial thoughts about resources. Yeah, um, yeah. So initially, what I thought of there are of course many many resources. There are plenty of I know that there are search engines specifically for finding LGBTQ affirming providers. But the thing, the first thing that pops into my mind, I guess, is um, the idea that you know you can you can put a rainbow flag in your clinic and you can still walk in and get misgendered the second you sit down. So. Um, I, I am a big fan of like peer to peer recommendations, especially for providers. I think that's something that the LGBTQ community has been doing for a long time and, um, is still perhaps the safest way to make sure that we're in actually going to LGBTQ affirming providers. Um, I think that there are, um, a lot of places that you can, you can, um, go though. What, another thing that comes to mind, um, maybe not specifically for finding, um, providers, there's the, we published the out, Brown published the outlist within the medical school, um, which was a good way of finding, um, physicians who are identifying as LGBTQ and also research mentors who are identifying as LGBTQ. So those are, there are plenty of good places to start, but I guess the first thing that popped into my mind was, um, just, making sure that even if even if things say that they're affirming making sure that we're safe um by by telling each other i guess where the safe places are to go dr brown any resources yeah so yeah thank you um and i also um i wanted to thank uh dr restar um just for that critique of uh dr litman's work it was really appreciated. <laughs> um, so thank you. That was great. Um, and uh, in terms of resources, I mean, I think a resource that I've really been able to benefit from, and I, but I, you know, I think sometimes you need to be patients there and sometimes you don't, are the behavioral health teams at the health community health centers. Um, often there's a, you know, there's kind of a crew of um, social workers, um, psychologists um, who can provide psychotherapy. Um, and, you know, I have to say, I, I don't know that they necessarily would list themselves as being um, friendly or affirming, um, but often if the referral is coming from a PCP, the PCP would know. Um, and so, and then I think in some of these health centers, you can just you can just access the mental health care. It kind of depends on which one it is. Sometimes you have to be a primary care patient. Sometimes you don't. Um, so I think you know, you know, obviously Thunder Mist is a is a wonderful example. Um, but some of the other health centers also have pretty big behavioral health departments. Um, uh, so you know, I've had situations where my patients in a community health center had an easier time finding therapists than folks I knew in the community. So you know, um, again, it, it's hard in terms of screening them for for being um, sensitive but um, but you know word of mouth and um, and uh, again word of mouth and, and potentially you know recommendations from providers can help another question that just came on the chat um, from Jordan what words would you give a young professional about entering a field of public health? and maybe even medicine that is getting pushback, such as reproductive rights, LGBTQ+. Pat? Um, I mean, I would say my initial thoughts are to just surround yourself with community of people, in my experience, people who, um, 
who are often engaged in this work are also personally affected by it in many ways that intersect and overlap and look different depending on the context. And, and um, for me, something that's just been um, really like such a lifeline for me has just been community with people who, you know, you might not always necessarily be talking about work, but sometimes you just need someone to chat with and say, this is really hard to be doing this work right now. And um, to hold space to kind of be vulnerable with one another and to also just show praise and to, to, to show love to one another for continuing to show up. Um, and I would also say that I like to think, and you know, if if people are in public health, I think if people are kind of angry at what we're doing, um, especially in um, I think the LGBTQI space, we we're probably doing something right. And um, I like to kind of lean into that in a way that helps just kind of keep keep me moving forward and kind of keeps inspiring me to, to, to move forward. And the last thing I would say is to really, especially as a first year PhD student, I've struggled to be intentional about really trying to find time to volunteer and to just build community. I'm not from Providence, I'm from Philadelphia. And I um, admittedly have just between classes and fellowship and everything, it can be challenging to just find time to to build community. Um, but when I have found that time, it's just been um, really enriching and central and so important. And so I think trying to center that as much as possible is really critical, um, especially as you think about entering into this space as someone who hopefully will um, be a leader that also aims to provide opportunity for community voice to be leading this this work. Um, so that's what I would say at least. Yeah. Um, I also just wanna add with uh, what Pat mentioned about the power of intersectionality um, in this work, right? So what you are, wait, who, who asked this question about um, reproductive health, reproductive justice and LGBTQ health? Um, Jordan, hi. Um, so I think this is where um, a lot of the, what Pat mentioned about intersectionality is really, really important in the work. Um, the same, in the policy level, the same uh, bills that are being passed or are being discussed around abortion care, around uh, gender affirming care are crafted by the same policymakers. And so it's really important for us as um, uh, as we are living also our own intersectional positionality, that um, to really connect those dots, right? To really connect those dots and build solidarity with one another. Um, and I often, in addition to what Pat mentioned, in addition to that, just sort of think about what our ancestors did. Um, you know, um, I, I, <laughs> I view the work as, as an Asian American trans woman. Like I, I view the work within that lens and I and I read and I and I and I learn about lessons of like what um uh, queer Asian American trans people did in the past in terms of like what it means to, you know, take power back or take, you know, or or to um mobilize, you know. Um and so really just learning about those different strategies is is, is is really important um, and perhaps, you know, um, uh, amplifying some of their messages would be wonderful and just start from there and understanding that if you are feeling alone, for example, that there are people uh, who are probably experienced the same way that you probably are experiencing now, who experienced it in the past and that in itself is kind of a nice, um, a nice reassuring thing that like this uh, unfortunate thing, obviously, that like this thing continues to um, to happen, but also there's a, a, a level of um, uh, reconciliation um, where you know you can you're like oh you're you're continuing their work, you're continuing their vision, and yeah, just just kind of understand you know some of the messages that they have bestowed upon us, um, and so definitely read up. Um, I'm trying my best these days to dedicate 30 minutes <laughs> um, of my day uh, before going to bed reading about, you know, um, writers that I have not been exposed to before um, due to the U.S. public health <laughs> um, education system. Um, but, you know, thinking about who in the past have 
experienced this and have written about this and what are their key messages and what can we learn from that? So. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, looks like we're out of time, but thank you so much to all of our panelists, Dr. Ristar, Dr. Brown, Victoria, and Pat. Um, Dr. Nazarino unfortunately had to hop off because she's off to another panel, um, but appreciate her help in organizing this with me. Thank you all for attending. I uh, hope you all learned as much as I did. I know that this was definitely very informative for me. Um, hope everyone has a good night and, um, you know, thanks for coming.